Let me, uh, it's my pleasure to open uh, uh, this meeting. Uh, my name is uh, San Bilal from uh, ECDPM, uh, and it is the first uh, hybrid uh, public event that ECDPM is organizing in our new office uh, here in Brussels. And we're very happy to, to welcome you and for your interest on this very important issue of uh, European development uh, finance in the crisis-ridden uh, era. And we are also grateful for the support of the French uh, Ministry for uh, uh, Europe and Foreign Affairs uh, for their support in our, in our work and uh, supporting this event as well. This meeting is going to take place both in English and in French. So if you have, for those online, if you want to follow the interpretation, you just have to go to the little, there's a very little uh, icon, a small globe on your, on the left-hand side, bottom left-hand side of your, uh, uh, of your screen. And if you click on it, you will see the uh, uh, mentioned original uh, audio. And if you click on the arrow, you can choose to have it either either to stick to this original audio if you want to if you want to do the follow on the whatever on the original language. Otherwise, you can choose English uh, or French. For those in the room, if you have problems, since we can we didn't manage to have a translation directly in the room, there is also in this room here the possibility to listen to the translation. Bienvenue à tous pour cette uh, réunion sur le financement du développement uh, par l'Europe dans une époque de, de crise. Uh, vous êtes les bienvenus pour ce premier uh, uh, événement uh, hybride organisé par uh, ECDPM. Et j'indiquais simplement que pour le lang la, les langues de travail pour cette réunion sont à la fois français et anglais. Donc pour ceux d'entre vous qui ne parlent que le uh, français, que je vous pouvez cliquer sur le petit, euh, petit symbole du, du globe de la Terre qui est en bas à gauche de votre écran. Et là, vous, si vous cliquez sur ce symbole, vous verrez qu'il y a indiqué « Original Audio ». Donc là, vous entendez euh, dans le langage dans lequel s'expriment les intervenants. Si vous cliquez sur la petite euh, flèche euh, sur votre droite, vous voyez que vous pouvez choisir le, la, la langue anglaise ou la langue française comme vous le désirez. Voilà, merci beaucoup. Ça, c'est pour les petits euh, aspects techniques d'introduction. J'ai maintenant, euh, maintenant le plaisir de, de me tourner vers euh, Cécile Merle, euh, qui est euh, la chef du pôle la politique européenne euh, de développement, de la sous-direction du développement au, ministre, au ministère de l'Europe et des Affaires étrangères. Euh, qui a la, au pied levé a, a accepté de remplacer euh, son directeur qui, qui n'était euh, plus disponible. Donc, merci beaucoup, euh, euh, Cécile. Euh, on, la parole est à vous. Merci beaucoup, San. Euh, donc, cher San, chers intervenants du panel, euh, cher public aussi, en présentiel ou connecté, donc merci à tous de nous rejoindre aujourd'hui autour de ce panel hybride, comme l'a rappelé San, organisé par le Centre européen de gestion des politiques de développement, donc l'ICDPM, avec le soutien de la France. Et comme le disait San, euh, malheureusement pour des raisons d'agenda, notre nouveau directeur du développement durable, M. Christophe Guillou, n'a pas pu finalement être avec nous cet après-midi et donc je, je le représente. Euh, donc cet événement public s'inscrit dans le cadre d'une coopération qui est, euh, est nouée depuis à peu près un an avec, euh, euh, entre le ministère de l'Europe et des Affaires étrangères français et euh, les think tanks de l'European Think Tank Group, à travers notamment l'ICDPM et, et également l'IDRI. Et avec nos collègues de l'ICDPM en particulier, nous avons travaillé sur euh, différents axes de travail afin non simplement d'appuyer les travaux de la présidence française euh, du Conseil de l'Union européenne, qui s'est tenue donc présidence au, au semestre dernier, et, mais également d'essayer de leur donner un élan au-delà de cette présidence. Et tout ceci en bonne intelligence avec euh, les actions et les priorités de la présidence tchèque du, du Conseil, qui est à nos côtés aujourd'hui et que je, je remercie de, de sa présence, euh, Christina. Je tiens également à remercier l'ensemble euh, des équipes de l'ICDPM pour leur appui, parce que vraiment, leurs contributions nous ont permis notamment de préparer, alors par exemple, pendant la, pendant la présidence française, les, les conclusions du Conseil adoptées en mai dernier sur le partenariat renouvelé 
de l'Union européenne avec les pays les moins avancés, qui, qui est une thématique qui est vraiment chère à la France, comme vous le savez. Nous avons eu également différents ateliers et notes de l'ICDPM qui ont participé à cette prise de conscience collective euh, de l'aspect géopolitique de la politique européenne de développement. Et euh, on a pu voir notamment ceci lors de la réunion ministérielle informelle des ministres européens du développement qui se, qui se sont réunis en mars dernier à, à Montpellier. Donc, notre environnement actuel, comme rappelé dans l'intitulé de ce panel, est marqué par les crises. Euh, on a tous en tête la pandémie de la COVID-19, qui est encore largement présente, l'invasion de l'Ukraine par la Russie, qui est également des conséquences dans les pays en développement, notamment en matière de sécurité alimentaire, nutritionnelle et énergétique. Et dans ce contexte, la politique européenne de, de développement demeure plus que jamais un outil indispensable pour atteindre les objectifs de développement durable de l'agenda 2030. Donc, le renforcement de la coopération et de la complémentarité des acteurs de l'architecture financière européenne du développement, donc ce que nous appelons en français la Fed, est vraiment essentiel pour nous donner les moyens d'agir en ce sens. Donc, je suis heureuse aujourd'hui de voir dans ce panel de nombreux représentants de l'équipe Europe euh, que cela soit nos collègues de la présidence tchèque, donc comme je l'ai déjà mentionné, mais également la Commission européenne, l'AFD, la BEI Monde, l'association IDFI. Donc merci à eux, merci de leur présence et de leur contribution. Et merci également aux représentants de la société civile euh, qui participent également au panel et euh, dont la voix compte. Donc avec les CDPM, euh, nous souhaitons aujourd'hui pouvoir aborder les méthodes et les moyens d'agir en européen en réponse aux crises auxquelles nous sommes donc tous confrontés, mais qui impactent tout particulièrement nos partenaires. Donc, la stratégie euh, Global Gateway, Global Gateway pardon, a déjà esquissé auprès de nos partenaires une offre européenne de qualité euh, pour le financement d'infrastructures. Et pour atteindre ces objectifs, euh, cette stratégie ambitieuse, elle devra s'appuyer sur tous les acteurs de la Fed et surtout aussi sur leur bonne coordination. Donc, elle supposera également de recourir à une gamme d'instruments diversifiés permettant de mobiliser les investissements privés chez nos partenaires et y compris les plus fragiles. Démontrant toute sa pertinence dans l'environnement actuel, Global Gateway va constituer un important facilitateur de souveraineté et de résilience au bénéfice de ses États partenaires de l'Union européenne. Donc, dans l'objectif d'un impact plus vert et durable, un défi majeur qui nous appartient de relever est de mieux aligner les financements disponibles sur l'accord de Paris et les ODD à travers des pratiques d'investissement respectant les normes et les standards les plus exigeants. C'est vraiment la condition sine qua non pour qu'on puisse générer un effet de levier, de levier transformationnel. Donc la France, elle impose déjà cette exigence à ses propres opérateurs de développement. Donc depuis 2017 déjà, le groupe AFD s'est engagé à mener une activité compatible à 100% avec l'accord de Paris. Plus encore, nous avons souhaité renforcer l'engagement de l'agence en faveur de la protection de l'environnement et la lutte contre le changement climatique, en fixant des objectifs qui sont ambitieux. 50% des projets octroyés ont un co-bénéfice climat. À l'approche de la COP15 sur la biodiversité, il nous faut aussi soutenir avec plus d'audace les solutions de financement respectueuse de la biodiversité. Et peut-être que le directeur général adjoint de l'AFD l'évoquera pendant sa, sa prestation, mais l'agence a développé une méthodologie robuste et elle s'est engagée à affecter 30% de ses financements climat à des projets présentant des co-bénéfices pour la biodiversité d'ici 2025. Donc nous encourageons en fait l'ensemble de, des acteurs de la Fed, donc de l'architecture financière européenne pour le développement, à prendre des engagements similaires pour aligner leurs activités sur les objectifs de la biodiversité. Enfin, si l'aide publique au développement est un canal opportun, important et opportun, bien sûr, elle demeurera insuffisante. C'est-à-dire qu'il faut réfléchir à de nouvelles ressources, à de nouvelles méthodes, Alors, comme l'utilisation, par exemple, de cet instrument monétaire international que sont les droits de tirage spéciaux dans le cadre du FMI, L'idée au G7 et au G20 d'une réallocation de ces DTS, des économies les plus avancées vers les plus vulnérables, doit être davantage promue. La France elle a tenu ses engagements pris en 2021 et réalloué 
20% de nos DTS, soit 5,5 milliards de dollars et 4 milliards de DTS. Et nous devons poursuivre nos efforts collectifs et porter l'objectif de réallocation à 30% des DTS. Il est essentiel aussi de soutenir des initiatives susceptibles d'aider les pays les plus vulnérables, notamment face au changement climatique. Et c'est pour ça que nous avons également soutenu la création du Resilience and Sustainability Trust au sein du FMI dans le cadre de prêts concessionnels. Donc là, c'est juste quelques petits euh, instruments qui, qui nous intéressent énormément. Mais de façon générale, euh, je pense que vous allez, euh, les membres du panel, euh, donner corps à, tout, à toutes ces idées. Et je vous remercie encore, en tout cas, de votre participation à ce panel. Le public également, donc toujours en présentiel comme en ligne. Euh, je vous souhaite de fructueux échanges et je repasse la parole à San. Et encore merci à lui et à ses équipes d'avoir pu organiser cette séquence. Merci. Merci beaucoup, euh, Cécile, pour, pour vos remarques euh, très pertinentes. Je retiendrai peut-être l'élément vraiment crucial aussi dans, dans cette approche, c'est qu'on ne doit pas opposer euh, le, développement, euh, la, le financement au développement et le financement climatique, euh, mais que c'est vraiment une, euh, une synergie, y compris pour la protection de la nature et, et de la biodiversité. Et puis le fait qu'il faut des ressources additionnelles et qu'il faut penser euh, peut-être avec euh, tous les outils qui sont à notre disposition. Donc ça, c'est un... C'est un élément important. Je vais maintenant vous faire peut-être quelques remarques supplémentaires sur l'état des réflexions qui sont en fait aussi le résultat de nombreuses conversations que j'ai eues. Ina, peut-être si tu peux mettre. Ina, if you can put the PowerPoint presentation, share the screen and the slides. Perfect. So thank you very much. So I just want to do a, a quick uh, tour d'horizon, in fact, on the, you know, what are some of the elements that we can uh, cover. I think the, the key message that I really want to, to come across uh, is that there is something in place and quite a lot already in place that has been done by, by the European uh, uh, Union, but uh, that it is not uh, sufficient because in the time of crisis, and the crisis that are going to continue, we need really to think differently. And so that means to try to innovate, to use what we have to the full potential, uh, and uh, to also put additional resources uh, if, uh, if we don't want to have higher costs uh, later down the line. So I think this is the kind of the gist of uh, what I want to say. Next slide, Ina. Thank you, Pat. Uh, perhaps you can go on the full, full screen mode so we don't have the bottom uh, items if you can you know okay on the issue of uh, thank you on the issue of the uh, uh, sustainable finance uh, framework i think that you know we are used now to this language the dark crisis we, we know and uh, you know we have that, heard that before i think what is quite unique though is that we're in a situation where we have multiple crises the climate the COVID, the energy the war in ukraine uh, by, by the russians Uh, the energy, the tighten, the inflationary pressure, the debt vulnerabilities, and so on. So, I mean, food crisis. So, we have really a large number of crises that are uh, that are coming on, and it seems that there is one succession, one crisis after the other, and and lumped together. And I think it's a signal that is really important that we have to learn how to live with crises and not see them as exceptional events like we had perhaps in 2008, and you have a crisis, we respond to the crisis, and then we go back to normal. So I think the question that we should have underlying is in the response that we provide to this crisis, are we able to, to, to respond to crises that are multiple, that are repetitive, and that we don't know what will be the next one? So this increasing level of uncertainty uh, probably also requires different type of uh, approaches. When we do that, now we have to know that there's a lot already that has been in place and the EU has been providing you know, developments uh, at the EU level. You have the development framework and the key global Europe. There's the European Fund for Sustainable Development Plus that learns on the initial European Fund for Sustainable Development. Uh, you have these you know, important notions of guarantees and leveraging this open architecture for DFIs and public development banks. So really a very nice setup for that. 
there has been uh, an explicit reflection and thinking about how this European financial architecture can work better together. So after a, a slow start with, the, in my view, uh, in, ineffective kind of reflection, now there is really a focus on how all the apparatus. Okay, please come sit next to me. I'm talking about how how fantastic uh, already the setting at the European level uh, is. So this this thinking on the European fund. Uh, the European financial architecture for development and how we can work better together. You know, this is, it's not uh, a reflection that happens all the time. So this is really started, there is an ambition to, to strengthen this. There is the team, uh, team uh, Europe approach, how we can work better together. Uh, and we have already a number of you know, new initiatives for more geopolitical Europe. So Green Deal, Global Gateway, and, and, and others, and, you know, how to have a policy first that is based on our values and interests. So there's plenty of elements that when we look at the policies and all what is there, so is, there's a lot of happening. Now, I have to say that when I talk to people about how you're going to respond to the crisis and so on, and I would say people, it's both policymakers, but also member states, EU, uh, uh, financial institutions, there's still a bit this notion that, yes, we have crisis, but we will mobilize our tools, the ones I've mentioned and, and, and some others. And if we mobilize our tools, then we'll be able to, to, to address properly this crisis. And my contention is that this is not going to be sufficient. So most of these tools and most of the, you know, if you just think about the, the development uh, framework that uh, we're operating in, the, the budget, the EU budget, as was initiated and thought out in what, 2018, 2019 by the European Commission, uh, and then after negotiations and so on, there was about 10% uh, reduction of the amounts. And we said, here we have the budget for 2021, 2022, uh, 2027. And that was before all, all the crises that we're mentioning. And now we say, well, with this, we work better together, but with these resources, we should be able to, to tackle the, the issue. And obviously this is not sufficient. And the same for most of the financial institutions, most of them didn't see uh, you know, additional resources available to them and so on. We ask them to, 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 to work with, with the tools they have. So I think there's really a need to rise to the challenge, to realize that there's no business as usual. We have really to, to try working differently. We can try to front load, uh, reallocate better some of the resources, uh, leverage more, uh, mobilize new resources. This is very important. And the last one, and I really would like to stress that, and I don't hear that enough, is that especially in times of crime, it's always the case, but especially in times of crisis and if we want to respond, we cannot afford to forget half of the population in the world. We have to focus on women. We all know that women are very important for the recovery, for the transformation of our economies. So they really need to be a centered uh, approach on how to uh, engage with, uh, uh, with women in this uh, and addressing the, the crisis. And with, we have the gender action plan three by, by the commission that is uh, supposed to provide some guidelines, but this is not enough. We really have to go uh, further than, than that. Next slide, please, and I'll speed up. <laughs> so just here to say that uh, we need to step up in times of crisis, but we should not dream also that everything is possible. Uh, and in particular, we know very well that resources are limited. A lot of resources in the EU will have to be spent on domestic agendas to respond to the domestic problems that this crisis uh, EU, uh, European member states are facing. And also, the, we know there will be an increased military efforts that is going to, to, to happen. So there are difficulties and a lot of resources will go internally. Now, externally, we know that Europe has said very clearly and very rightly that supporting Ukraine is a prime strategic interest. So we know that a lot will have to be done for Ukraine. And in my view, that's where probably most of the innovation should come from to be able to respond at the right level. Imagine in the US Congress, if the Republicans win uh, and decide to go with cutting uh, part of the support to, to Ukraine, or in 2024, uh, if Trump wins as a president and the US decides that uh, we should not uh, keep helping Ukraine. So, what will you, <laughs> Europe uh, do? Uh, how do we mobilize? And even if we have uh, the US still uh, standing behind Ukraine, you know, is, is Europe able to deliver on what we want to do in Ukraine? So in my view, Ukraine will be a, an area where we can also innovate and learn from the innovations or draw from the innovations on Ukraine for the rest of uh, the rest of the world. 
but there will be more resources that have to be dedicated there, more resources for humanitarian aid that we know and for, for refugee crisis. Uh, and, and we're afraid that a new one can, can come with the bombing uh, uh, of, of Ukraine vital infrastructures currently by, by Russia. And there will be an increased allocation for, for the eastern uh, neighborhoods that are directly uh, affected by, by the war in Ukraine. So is development, so we can call for more development aid and we should, but will that be sufficient? My answer is no. We, we will never be able to have more uh, at the level that we need more development aid. So what we need is to try to find about more catalytic type of approaches uh, that can help respond in a more agile, flexible ways uh, and in a coordinated manner for some of the challenges that we are confronted with. And we have to try to do that really at scale and, and broader level. Next slide, please, uh, Ina. So let me just consider very quickly some broad development uh, finance avenues that, uh, and, and not only finance, but some broad avenues that should be uh, considered. Next slide. Uh, so the first one is, uh, and that was already uh, mentioned uh, uh, by uh, by Cecile. We have to address the the debt uh, vulnerabilities and and probably distress uh, that will come. I mean, we we know, and the IMF again uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago clearly indicated we are in very serious situations. The debts we should expect probably a debt crisis. So the question is, what is Europe doing collectively about it? We know that there are some initiatives by some member states, but what is the collective approach of the EU to try to address the looming debt crisis? Uh, what are the kind of new uh, initiatives? So I suggested here on the, on the slide some, some possibilities of thinking of, of how it could be done. But if we're looking at what is concretely Europe suggesting, except saying, well, we need to address the crisis, uh, I think this is really important because Europe can by itself and you know by coming together is quite important to engage with the other parties to, to try to find a collective uh, solution uh, globally. The second element, and uh, Cecile also mentioned that, is the special drawing rights. So there has been this issue of special drawing rights, uh, 100 billion, uh, 650 um, uh, billions that have been uh, uh, allocated. There's this commitment uh, by, um, uh, by the G7 and G20 to reallocate hundreds uh, billions to the more uh, to the countries most in need. Uh, at the IMF, there is the resilience and uh, sustainability trust that has been put in place. The PRGT, uh, poverty and uh, reduction and growth trust, that is there. So, but we are we are over a year after the, the process, and still we have not seen the implementation. So that's the, the, the first point. So we're, we're starting just implementation. So we need to be able to, and what I hear from the, the countries in need is stop talking, just, just deliver, implement what is there. But we also need to have collective commitments. So we've heard about the, the, the commitments and really ambitious commitments by, by France. Uh, some other large countries, Italy, Spain, have made commitments, some, a few others, but collectively, what has the EU done? They have said that yeah, we are committed to try to collectively reallocate. But where are the numbers? What are each EU member states doing? And this is not for the European Commission to decide. This is really an issue for the for the EU member states. So can we, can we not have a commitment by 20, 27 EU member states that indicate uh, what are the SDRs that they would reallocate? We know that the, the, the channel of choice is the IMF, but the one that could have the most catalytic impact is through the multilateral development banks. So here there are some technical problems, uh, but can we not try to think and, and help also to try to identify these solutions? The African Development Bank, some others are trying to find technical solutions. Can we not get the support from the EU member states and what could be done? <laughs> Discuss with the European Central Bank if we can solve these uh, regulatory hurdles that the Europeans have or otherwise find uh, some equivalent measures, but the SDRs are really definitely a big tool to uh, to have big firepower. Next slide. So then there's the question of strengthening the MDBs, and so I have a collective reflection of how multilateral development banks could be working better together. There has been some very concrete and very uh, insightful proposals uh, that have been made by the uh, independent uh, group of experts for the G20 on uh, on, on the capital uh, adequacy framework with a number of uh, very uh, useful suggestions. There's been other suggestions that have been made. So there also, what is the position of the EU member states 
collectively they sit uh, many of them sit in the in the boards of these uh, of these mdbs is it possible to have the eu coming uh, jointly together with the, you know some common positions and and prioritizing some of the changes and adjustments they want to do we've had i think just the last few days uh, the germany uh, uh, that uh, sided with the uh, 20, one of those 20 uh, countries to propose that the World Bank increases uh, uh, more climate finance and uh, adopts new uh, uh, new approaches and so on. Can we have the EU collectively agree on some of these elements? And, and what are they? Next slide. Now, boosting green finance is, is really key. Cecile has, has stressed that. I think there are also there are a lot of elements. And again, I, I would stress the fact that we should not think about there are many concrete actions that could be taken by the financial institutions themselves collectively with the member states working better between donors and, uh, and member states on these issues. And dealing with the green finance, it should be in synergy with development objectives and, and not an alternative. And uh, the last one is the question of illicit financial flows. It's pointless to try to pump more money in the uh, developing countries if there's a lot of uh, uh, illicit flows that are going out of these developing countries and it's not tackled. So we have to look at all, all sides. And again, here we need to have uh, by EU member states a more, uh, a more proactive uh, type of approach on, on how to pursue this at the international arena. Next. So now, if I just want to go quickly through how we could uh, strengthen the effort, and uh, by the way, the PowerPoint will be is available online uh, on the web page of the, uh, uh, or should be available online on the web page of the event. So you, you can also go see more of the details. And in the coming weeks, I will publish several of these elements where I go more in detail. But next slide, please. We have really done a lot of efforts in the context of the European financial architecture for development on the governance. And so there are now many places where we can address the governance of the uh, financial architecture. But the end result seems to be a highly fragmented governance system where you do have uh, discussions in the context of uh, NDKI, in the context of uh, EFSD+, Plus. Uh, in the global gateway, there will be uh, concrete proposals. There are already concrete proposals on the table on how to have the governance of this. You have in the Team Europe initiatives, uh, uh, several have their own governance system. In the Council has been responding to that. So you have the, uh, the board advisory group of the EIB Global, where it's also supposed to provide advice. You have uh, uh, the European DFIs that are coming together and their shareholders coming together and discussing what they could be doing. You have discussions within the EBRD uh, and in other MDBs. So there are many places. Now, it's not necessarily the same people and the same representative from the member states that are going in all of them. So one of the responses that I heard from several stakeholders, is, we are overloaded by governments. Please stop about setting up new set setup and so on. We don't want to hear anymore. We are already too... Uh, stretch too thinly about this. But where is the global perspective of all these different arenas? Where do you bring that all together? What is the place? It, it is still to me seems to be uh, partly missing and where there would be a good reason to, to think about that. And to think also about the, uh, uh, the coordination, not only about the, at, at the EU level, but uh, um, I mean, not only at the EU level with the EU budget, uh, and the Commission has been very strong in, in pushing this coordination, but what member states themselves are doing, and that is uh, very important. And that leads me to the second point of the uh, of the approach that, you know, uh, definitely the, the the Commission and the and the Council have taken a very strong role on the EU budget for this coordination and this approach. But as a result, there is, in my view, a tendency in the discussion on the European financial architecture for development to focus too much, almost exclusively on things where the EU budget is involved, while in fact member states are doing a lot of other activities, sometimes with, but also a lot without the EU budget. So we should not be over focused on the EU budget, but think about these other own initiatives that are taking place. And in fact, a lot is happening. I mean, we have the, uh, you know, the, uh, we have these setups that exist by 
uh, by financial institutions, the EBRD, the EIB have, uh, have, have some setups, the ETFI have their, their, their own platforms for coordinations that, uh, that exist. So can we not try to use these platforms where you have donors and DFIs coming together, and, and when you have different DFIs and public development banks coming together, EIB, EBRD and others, where is it that you know, we, they could collectively be active and not necessarily always with the EU? Uh, budget type of support. Next slide, please. Next, Ina. Yeah, thanks. So in that sense, there's really a need to promote the partnership. Now, if you want to do that also uh, uh, be, beyond the EU budget, there's a need to promote partnerships within the EU. Uh, no, uh, one back. <coughs> Ina, you went too fast. One back. Yes, we need to co increase the coordination within the EU, uh, strengthening uh, the partnership and coordination among financial institutions. I just mentioned several of the uh, initiatives, uh, and uh, you know, for instance, Jeffic and Edfi are now you know platforms together. There are plenty of elements uh, that are coming. Uh, you know, we lost the uh, PowerPoint uh, sharing, but it's also with the other institutions that are. Uh, 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 that are there, and, and I think it's a question of how to coordinate with public, uh, uh, with public and com uh, with public and private sector institutions. So how to look at the private uh, investors, uh, how to think about the commercial and non-commercial type of public endeavors. So how the export credit agencies and the DFIs, public development banks, could work better together. So there's really a number of type of engagements that could be. Uh, uh, that could be considered, uh, and the work could also entail then a number of, uh, of issues, and here on the bottom of the slide you uh, have outlined uh, some. Next slide. Now, there's also the need to cooperate outside the EU with international actors, with the public, I'm just back from the, I'm just back from the uh, excellent uh, Finance and Commons Summit that was jointly organized by the EIB and the African Development Bank in Abidjan, so where the whole focus was how public development banks could work better together. So could we have some, you know, European joint European initiatives to work with other international public development banks and DFIs? That would be quite interesting. There are a number of other initiatives internationally also where we see normally the participation is a bit in an ad hoc manner by some financial institutions. So could we have a more collective approach by, by the EU? The point is really to try to encourage innovation, reactivity, diversity, and harmonization in, in some of these elements. So we know that, in fact, when I talk to financiers, and so there's a lot of innovations coming there. Can we have exchanges on, on what is to, to innovate? Could we have more syndication? EDFI is doing that well uh, with, the, with the EIB, with some other institutions. So could we see more of that? So uh, institutions coming together and investing jointly. Could they have more secur securitization? So that means getting out of the balance sheets of some of the public development banks, some of the, the, the more mature uh, projects that are sell, sell back to the, to the market, perhaps in, in combination with working with insurance companies and so on. And that would free some of the space for public development banks uh, on, on their capital and, and be able to engage in new projects and so on. Can we find new ways of uh, being more adaptive and more reacting in, in working differently? Next slide. And this is, uh, this is the end. Can we try to front load? Because this is what we have to do now. And I think the, the, the Commission has been doing front loading, but front loading is only valid for, for some stage. So uh, can we also mobilize additional resources? Uh, and in, in my view, there is a need to think about humanitarian aid definitely is, is uh, key. Do we want to keep all the, if we have a limited amount of aid, perhaps what is the elements of the tra more traditional development cooperation agenda that should really be kept, <laughs> but some of the resources perhaps should be, of aid should be reallocated to be able to catalyze more, more finance and think more about these, uh, uh, these leveraging type of, uh, uh, of approaches that uh, definitely with development finance we can we can foster and how can we also increase really the work between the donors what the traditional development cooperation is doing and the development agencies and what the dfis and public development banks are doing i think by combining efforts and resources instead of thinking 
uh, too much perhaps still in parallel of the activities, but combining some of the activities, we, we consider there's a great leverage together with the European think tank group, uh, a group of, uh, uh, of European think tanks, uh, and for the practitioners network who conducted a number of uh, studies where we look at cases of how public development banks in Europe and DFIs cooperate with the donors and implementing agencies, and there are plenty of very interesting lessons that can be capitalized uh, on. So this was just, I was running and still uh, too, too long in my presentation, but that was just to show the landscape of many things that could be done, and I'm sure there's in fact many more initiatives uh, that could be uh, uh, carried out, and there's a need, you know, the, the prospect was to try to outline an agenda, and of course there's a need to focus on perhaps some of the priorities, uh, what is the most uh, important to, to tackle uh, at this stage. We cannot do it all at once, uh, but uh, how can we move forward? And in that respect, I'm very happy to, to first turn to a nice panel that we have uh, here in the room and online, uh, and to turn to Kristina Hrdrokova, uh, who, uh, uh, who is the representative here for the Czech uh, presidency of the uh, uh, of, the, of the Council of the European Union, sorry, uh, and then uh, perhaps tell us what are your priorities and how you see uh, some of the way forward. Christina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, for having me. And uh, as you know, uh, we as a Czech presidency are really uh, involved in this topic. Uh, because uh, we chose six priorities for our presidency in development cooperation and two priorities directly uh, directly uh, deals with this topic and uh, one is connected with this one uh, is uh, IFAT, uh, IFAT rollout and involvement of the uh, or in Proving the involvement of the European private sector, uh, which is a topic that uh, ECDPM is working on uh, with us. Uh, then the second topic is uh, the NDK Global Europe and Team Europe uh, in, uh, implementation, and uh, also the TI's governance. And uh, actually, this afternoon we uh, had. Uh, uh, we are still having actually uh, uh, a session uh, in the council uh, where we focus on TI governance. Uh, so uh, it's it's very uh, timely discussion. Uh, and uh, under the uh, IFA, we particularly focus on inclusiveness uh, and not only towards the DFIs and uh, small and new development banks, but also towards the private sector, uh, which was the European private sector, because we understand that it's kind of like subtopic, but very relevant one uh, under the IFAT and the whole architecture. And uh, it's also very re relevant uh, with, the, uh, with the Global Gateway, which we also got uh, for chairing. So it was kind of, present and surprise uh, quite quite shortly before our presidency. Uh, it's very interesting to see both lines, the development line, uh, because we are chairing CODEF PI working party, and also the global gateway line, and how to, how to approach these both perspectives, and also how to combine the classic development perspective and how to combine the global gateway approach, which is wider, and also work a bit with different principles uh, and how to work with trade perspective and how to work with the development perspective, which is, I must be honest, very challenging, I think, for whole Team Europe. <laughs> So uh, that's something we are we are currently dealing with uh, the EU institutions, but also us as, as uh, Czech presidency. Uh, what is also very interesting, uh, and it also relates to this whole discussion, is how to combine the long-term goals we have under the SDGs, uh, but also how to combine the current challenges. And I think that. Uh, for us, the Ukraine case, it's very, very interesting how to combine uh, 
the the perspective not only of the reforms at the Tsura, but also the um, SDGs uh, agenda and the climate and energy transition, and uh, as well as the uh, the immediate needs, which are obvious uh, in Ukraine, and also how to deal with the governance structure and the implementation structure in the field. Uh, so I think that we have quite lots of cases where we can learn a lot. And uh, what what is also very important for us uh, is not only that we work with some, you know, with the agendas that are on the table already, but we also know that something will be on the table, but there are also issues that we don't probably know that we will have to deal with. So, that's that's quite hard and challenging how to come how to how to pro project this in in the approaches and in the planning and uh regarding the general challenges i was thinking about when i was preparing for this debate um so i i won't mention the the financial perspective is such uh, in very detailed way, but I will I will focus rather on a bit more general, but I think very important perspective. And one challenge is uh, which I see because I only uh, I uh, I deal not only with the uh, presidency and that we are setting up the uh, agenda and from the level of. Uh, discussing what we will put on FAC development, but also I'm, I'm coordinator of uh, NDK uh, committee. So I <clears throat> Justina, we lost you. Justina, we cannot hear you. We cannot see you anymore. Christina is in Prague. We lost you, Christina. Are you here? Christina? Uh, some connection problem. So I don't know if she. Christina, I'm trying again. Yeah, you're back. We can see you. You are muted. Sorry, uh, it was a mistake on my side. Sorry for that. Uh, so uh, for us, uh, it's the rolling out the implementation of, of what we have already prepared with the whole new uh, budget uh, and also with the whole EFAT. Uh, and also, that we have already identified some gaps uh, and also that we are learning a new practice which is connected not only with NDK but also with the Team Europe approach and we need to stabilize uh, that practice, learn what's the best approach, uh, what are still the gaps and uh, also what is very interesting to see uh, is that we agree upon the Team Europe work and Team Europe approach, but also uh, there is still some competition, you know, and it's natural um, among the DFIs, among the business. Uh, so, and we have to have to deal with this uh, somehow, and also how to how to deal in practice with information sharing, how to set up the processes that what is possible to share with whom and what should be confidential, what sh should be the the practice. So that's something that's very big task in practice for us. Uh, and I mean for us all, uh, for the EU institutions, but also for the uh, banks, for the companies, what, what to share with whom. Uh, and also, what's very what's very interesting uh, and what will be important for my side 
case uh, addressing the gaps that we have identified. For instance, uh, from our per experience, we, we have already observed some gaps uh, in the uh, inclusiveness, uh, which is connected to the EFSD plus core, uh, and it's connected to the uh, incentivizing the consortia in joint pr uh, proposals, which doesn't probably work how it was mentioned. So the question is if we will be somehow able to react on that to improve that during this programming period or not. Uh, and also what is what is very important because we are uh, under the IFAD, we are uh, discussing if it's revolution or evolution and so on. But what I think it's important is to learn from that and stabilize the processes which really work and, and mainstream that. Um, what uh, what I think is also important in uh, context of Team Europe approach is, uh, and also in the global gateway uh, approach, so it's the political leadership, you know, uh, how to get players on board, various players, how to how to get member states on board, how to get banks on board, how to get uh, private sector on board, uh, and how to how to really cooperate together, which is not in practice itself, it's not easy. Uh, and I think that maybe Ukraine could be a good case where we could really learn uh, a lot. And I think that okay. we can we can discuss some things later uh, in the discussion. Great, thanks a lot. I think uh, I mean I like your emphasis on on you know on on learning uh, already from the early lessons or potential gap gaps. It's obviously to work together is not necessarily easy. It's not sufficient to say we want to work together to to do it. So there are practical uh, constraints, and it's important to to get them. And of course, this notion of inclusiveness is is absolutely key key uh, on the way forward if we want to have not just few uh, member states um, uh, working together or few large actors working together but all of them and i like your comments on deal with the unknown uh, it's, it's hard enough to deal with the known but how to deal with the unknown and, and i think that's probably what we have to learn uh, to to do because we'll have increasing uh, uncertainty Bruno Venn, we're very uh, lucky to uh, to have you uh, for your uh, very deep experience. If there's really somebody knowledgeable on uh, on on all these questions, is is you. So thank you very much for uh, for joining us. You are the chairperson of the board of directors of the associations of the European Development Finance Institutions. Uh, EDFI has uh, been uh, referred to uh, very often for, and you have seen also the evolution yourself in the health. ETFI evolved over the years on all these questions of how to work better together, but not just ETFI alone, but together with uh, other uh, other partners. So I'm eager to to listen to your views and uh, your insights on, on how to strengthen this uh, European financial architecture in times of crisis. We know you're muted. So <clears throat> many thanks, uh, San, and for the opportunity to speak. And also thank you for your slides. Uh, I would uh, eager to subscribe to a lot of uh, the issues that you have raised. But we, as the uh, EDFI, celebrating our 13th anniversary, uh, we we believe very much that we are a good road model for for working together since. Um, we are 15 European Development Finance Institutes uh, are working since more than 30 years together, following the lead as an effective and cost effective mode of collaboration and based on harmonized standards and procedures. And we have a long history of working officially with EBRD, EIB, EF, IFC, other international, regional, and bilateral development financial institutions. And we are very much looking forward to work with the European DFIs being created in some of the member states, like also in the Czech. Republic. Underlying the crucial role of the private sector in addressing the multiple 
crisis uh, that we are facing and recalling the key role of EDFI members in promoting the private sector in developing countries, especially in Africa, as well as in mobilizing the much needed private sector resources for green, digital and inclusive growth. European DFIs welcome the Team Europe uh, approach and the strengthened European financial architecture for development as the right direction to increase the significance, the relevance and the impact of European development finance at uh, the development policy. Since the approach is meant to foster greater collaboration, synergies and coherence among EU actors. The multiple crises call for concerted and joint actions building on the diversity and the complementarity of the many European actors in the European development policy. Today, strategic coordination and cooperation are needed much more than ever to tackle the multiple crises. By bringing all relevant players and actors at one table, we have the great opportunity to strengthen the strategic role in coordination as well as enhancing complementarity and coherence and doing so efficiency and impact. Therefore, for us at EDFI, transparency, open architecture, access to information and participation in the discussions are key. This is still a process in the making and the launch of the Global Gateway um, uh, uh, initiative a year ago has marked indeed an important milestone in terms of EU asserting its geopolitical relevance and ambition. We have now a much we have now much clarity with respect to the articulation of team europe's initiatives and how they will contribute to global gateway and this is much welcome and we are also welcome that the dfis will be included in the global gateway governance and this is of course equally reassuring another dimension that remains still to be clarified is how we engage with the private sector which was also mentioned by christina at EDFI's involvement in Global Gateway and EFAT is crucial in that respect, as we have experience in working with the pro with private sector, uh, and we are the institutions that are designed for ex for this purpose. We would ideally like to have an EFAT with a focus more towards the objective of engaging further and mobilizing private sector, both European private sectors and local ones. I would like to share with you uh, some. Uh, adjustments that we would like to see. First of all, we need to focus much more on strategy than technical issues in our coordination. The focus should be on setting the policy, considering the different mandates, strengths and complementarity of the various actors. For example, European DFIs play a key role in investing where the private sector is not ready to invest yet. Therefore, we would like to ensure that in the policies, the right balance is set between additionality and mobilization expectations of the EU. Where DFI financing is most additional, for example, in fragile states, mobilization targets must be less ambitious than in sectors where private finance is already present and the DFIs act more as co-investors. Secondly, for the implementation, we need to intensify the cooperation and working together. What is still missing in our view is a governance body, a place where all Team Europe, the uh, national development banks, DFIs and IFIs can coordinate and agree together with EU institutions, member states on the implementation of the Global Gateway and related to this EFDs plus. EDFI has been asked, uh, has asked to, several times to be represented as an observer in the EF. Uh, as the plus the treaty board precisely for this reason, because we believe that it would be a relevant body to, re to receive clear political steer from EU uh, institution member states and coordinate views and priorities across European finan finance institutions at a strategic level. For example, we should be able as Team Europe to issue clear statements and roadmaps on climate, Ukraine, blended finance and so on. We need a body that would allow uh, this to happen. For now, the Team Europe DGs meeting are very useful, but we would like that there to see a much stronger focus on the strategy for the investment in infrastructure support programs that will be needed for Global Gateway. The third issue is we need to be faster and more flexible in using the existing instruments to translate policies and concrete actions. This is especially true now in the midst of multiple crises. Today's implementation of blended finance programs remains at small scale, at relatively high cost, 
and at a relatively high time requirement. Likewise, within existing regulations, there are no incentives to create platforms for joint investments. For example, we as EDFI, we have created in 2016 the EDFI management company by EDF members as a platform for joint actions and joint use of EU financial resources for market development. But still, the EDFI management company is not uh, be able to get uh, access to EU funding directly uh, because uh, it cannot be pillared assessed. Working with private sector investors require equally efficiency and flexibility, which are two qualities uh, European DFIs are generally recognized for. This is the reason why we call for a successful rollout of EFD Plus to consider relying as much as possible on the existing framework uh, of the DFIs for impact measurements and stand and ESI st and ENS standards. We would like to see a review of the many financial and other regulations with a view to increase flexibility and to speed up the whole process as well as to reduce cost and time. The fourth issue is we need to focus on harmonization and standards. EDFI members are working towards development further the Paris alignment and methodologies and are working towards compliance with the EU taxonomy. But there is currently no common forum to design harmonized practices. DHD INPA, for example, is currently drafting, a, in our view, a rather complex result management framework with very granular indicators that lack practicability and links with existing DFI practice. We would like to see that EU harmonization standards is built on what we have already developed with our international and bilateral peers. We risk having different interpretations and different methodologies while the objective for all is Paris alignment. The fifth is we need to focus more on policy dialogue and interventions with the aim to create the policy and regulator environment for structural change and transformation. DFIs and private sector actors will need support from the EU and other donors in building the right business and investment environment, as well as setting the right legal and regulatory conditions for sustainable and green investments. We believe mobilizing private finance will also require that EU EU resources are dedicated much more to project origination and project preparation. And we need specific programs to turn unbankable opportunities into bankable ones. So six, we need to scale up uh, by using the guarantees in a much better way to mobilize private sector finance for climate and sustainable development. And the key message is to be effective and attractive. These tools need to be flexible enough but we observe that there's still a lot of complexity in structuring blended finance schemes as well as guarantees, which are hindering the implementation and the potential to scale up those. In short, we need to be faster, flexible. We need to work with harmonized standards that are practical, usable, and based on uh, um, accepted uh, <clears throat> and already existing international standards. And the seventh point, and finally, is we need to enable our international network as a leverage for European approaches. I am very much concerned that some of our international partners see the Team Europe approach as a closed EU shop. But working together beyond Europe is key in terms of relevance and significance. For example, within the G7, the European development finance institutions work very closely together with our peers in Japan, Canada and the US to promote gender finance, green finance and global infrastructure investment. In our coalition for micro and small and medium sized enterprise, uh, enterprise financing in Africa, we cooperate with regional development finance institutions in Africa like the West African Development Bank, the African Development Bank and the Trade and Development Bank. And finally, with our international and bilateral peers, we are working on joint standards for impact measurements and reporting. So then you have uh, now a lot of issues that, uh, that, uh, that in our view could be extremely helpful to, um, to realize much more what we have already implemented in the, better, in the, in the best interest of our clients uh, in the private sector, but also for the many people who are looking very much uh, for better use of European taxpayers' money. Many thanks. Well, thank you very much, uh, Bruno, for, <laughs> I was not expecting less from you, from a good assessment of the situation, but also very concrete type of recommendations on, on the way forward. And indeed, I can just say, looking at the 
uh, as an observer from outside, I mean, it's impressive to see all the initiatives taken by EDFI. And then one is thinking on how, you know, could we boost this EDFI type of approach? I'm not saying that EDFI is better than the others, but because it's a collective, it's a large collective of, uh, of financial institutions, you know, how could we harness other financial institutions and other initiatives around some of these, uh, you know, experience and elements that EDFI has been uh, providing? And just back, I was mentioning, I was back from the Finance and Commons Summit, uh, at least in the corridors, I don't think it was mentioned in the, on stage, but in the corridors, the comments was that, oh, blended finance is, is, could be a great instrument, but it's we need to simplify it and make it easier to use. It's too complex. And that's what we hear from a lot of finances and from development finance so let alone private sector that then are saying you know by the time we have anything ready uh, it's, it's too long so um, this is kind of uh, uh, interesting though you know i haven't heard you much saying what eu member states were supposed to to, to really do also uh, themselves and not only from from the commissions but i know your, your time was limited let's go to let's turn to bertrand valkenar uh, je, je vous vois maintenant en, en ligne euh, vous êtes le, le directeur euh, adjoint, directeur général adjoint de l'Agence française euh, de développement, AFD. Merci beaucoup de, de nous rejoindre. Et puisque je mentionnais, entre autres, ce que pouvait être fait au niveau national, votre intervention est, est, est typiquement la bienvenue, parce que c'est en fait cette articulation entre à la fois les initiatives nationales, les, les initiatives entre, euh, entre pays et... Euh, euh, on est tous au courant de, de l'initiative euh, JFI qui, qui prend euh, les différents, euh, euh, différents banques publiques de développement ensemble. Vous êtes aussi parti euh, de plusieurs initiatives avec EDFI. Est-ce que vous faites au niveau euh, européen Donc cette articulation à plusieurs niveaux euh, est tout à fait intéressante. Je vous laisse la parole. Merci beaucoup San. Est-ce que vous pouvez me confirmer que vous m'entendez Je vous entends et on vous voit très bien. Parfait, merci beaucoup. Bonjour San, bonjour Cécile qui est intervenue en début de séance et je salue également Bruno que j'ai déjà eu l'occasion de voir, de rencontrer à plusieurs reprises. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Merci beaucoup de me donner l'occasion d'intervenir à l'occasion de ce panel qui est intéressant pour, me semble-t-il, plusieurs raisons. La première, San, vous en avez un petit peu parlé dans votre introduction, c'est le contexte macroéconomique dans lequel nous nous trouvons aujourd'hui. Cela a été abondamment débattu à l'occasion des assemblées d'automne du FMI et de la Banque mondiale. Et c'est la situation particulière que mentionnait également Cécile dans son introduction. Des crises qui se succèdent depuis maintenant quand même quelques années, commencées par la crise Covid, les enjeux en matière de sécurité alimentaire depuis l'invasion de l'Ukraine par la Russie, et puis en toile de fond depuis bien plus longtemps, bien sûr, mais la question de la lutte contre le changement climatique et euh, des impacts que euh, ces, euh, ces événements euh, météorologiques extrêmes peuvent avoir de plus en plus sur euh, les pays, en particulier les plus vulnérables. Donc ça, c'est un aspect de la photographie. Le deuxième aspect de la photographie, ce sont euh, des économies euh, dites des pays euh, riches qui se trouvent aujourd'hui dans une situation un peu particulière puisque si on compare l'année 2022 avec euh, les années euh, 2000, au moment des initiatives de restructuration de dette des pays pauvres, nous sommes en 2022 dans une situation très différente puisque le niveau d'endettement des pays les moins avancés a atteint à nouveau des montants très significatifs et dans le même temps, les pays riches, les pays donateurs, ont eux, eux aussi également, et pour la première fois je pense dans l'histoire du financement du développement, un niveau de dette qui est très significatif. Et donc ça, c'est un nouveau paradigme avec lequel on n'a jamais eu, je crois, jusqu'à présent vraiment à, à, à traiter, d'avoir un niveau d'endettement très élevé du côté des pays en développement et puis un niveau d'endettement assez aussi significatif du côté des pays industrialisés. Ça, c'est le deuxième aspect de la photo. Et puis, bah, le troisième aspect de la photo qui, évidemment, va avoir un impact sur la, la façon dont nous agissons et les instruments que nous pouvons mobiliser, c'est l'environnement macroéconomique de 2023 et des anticipations du FMI sur la croissance de l'Europe, la croissance des États-Unis, la croissance des pays africains qui soulèvent quand même beaucoup de questions sur les risques macroéconomiques associés à des niveaux de croissance faibles qui, qui, qui se cumulent avec 
la sortie euh, et les conditions euh, difficiles de sortie de la période Covid. Donc ça, c'est la façon dont, euh, en tant que bailleur de développement, nous voyons et nous anticipons la préparation de l'année 2023 avec euh, ces trois grands risques que je viens de, de citer. Le deuxième sujet qui me paraît très euh, important, et Cécile l'a également euh, mentionné dans son introduction, c'est l'agenda qui est le nôtre euh, aujourd'hui, un agenda de lutte contre la pauvreté, et vous l'avez mentionné, San, dans votre introduction, un agenda de lutte contre le changement climatique. Et comment est-ce qu'on arrive, parce que c'est évidemment là qu'est l'enjeu pour nous, comment est-ce qu'on arrive à concilier ces deux agendas Et là, il y a un certain nombre de réflexions qui sont en cours sur ben, le, le, le narratif historique ou les raisons initiales historiques de la mobilisation des pays en faveur de l'aide publique au développement, donc ça nous renvoie aux années 1970-1980 avec ce narratif qui était initialement construit autour de la lutte contre la pauvreté et puis dans les années 90, la lutte contre le changement climatique qui est devenue très significative et très mobilisatrice de la communauté internationale et qui a rejoint en fait, parce qu'il n'existait pas d'autres politiques mondiales, globales à cette date, qui a rejoint la problématique de l'aide publique au développement. Et les deux sujets, lutte contre la pauvreté, lutte contre le changement climatique, qui sont complémentaires à certains égards, mais qui peuvent être aussi euh, euh, distincts à d'autres égards, notamment dans les économies euh, émergentes, ces deux sujets sont aujourd'hui euh, traités dans une seule et même enceinte, qui est celle de la gestion de l'aide publique au développement. Avec une question qui peut se poser euh, aujourd'hui de manière euh, assez légitime, me semble-t-il, qui est qu'au euh, moment où euh, les problématiques euh, de lutte contre le changement climatique s'élargissent avec notamment la prise en compte de la biodiversité et la façon dont la biodiversité peut nourrir l'agenda climatique, est-ce que le maintien dans une seule et même enceinte et sous un seul et même label, l'aide publique au développement, est-ce que le maintien de la lutte contre la pauvreté et de la lutte contre le changement climatique a encore euh, du sens Donc il y a des réflexions qui ont lieu euh, à ce jour sur euh, bah, la façon de garder les acquis d'une politique mondiale qui a acquis ces lettres de noblesse au fil du temps, qui est celle de l'aide la, de publique au développement, l'impact que euh, la lutte contre le changement climatique a eu au sein de l'aide publique au développement sur euh, les méthodes de comptabilisation, les instruments et euh, toute l'architecture financière mondiale du développement telle qu'elle existe euh, aujourd'hui. Donc ça, c'est un sujet qui me paraît également euh, important à avoir en tête, alors que nous sommes en train d'aborder des nouveaux sujets que sont... Euh, la mobilisation, par exemple, des droits de tirage spéciaux du FMI. Est-ce que ces droits de tirage spéciaux, euh, quelles sont les modalités d'utilisation de, de ces droits de tirage spéciaux en matière de lutte contre la pauvreté, en matière de lutte contre le changement climatique Ce sont des nouveaux instruments qui, à mon avis, peuvent nous amener à réexaminer euh, le, le cadre stratégique et le cadre de la politique mondiale mis en place depuis maintenant 60 ans en matière d'aide publique au développement pour se demander si c'est un cadre qui est encore pertinent aujourd'hui pour nous emmener dans la bonne direction et nous amener à mobiliser beaucoup plus largement, c'est un point qui a été évoqué par Bruno également, pour nous amener à mobiliser beaucoup plus largement le, le secteur privé. Et c'est donc mon troisième point, et merci beaucoup San d'avoir fait référence au sommet Finance en commun, j'espère que je n'ai même pas pu y aller la semaine dernière à Abidjan, je l'ai beaucoup regretté, mais j'espère que ce que vous y avez vu et entendu était à la fois intéressant, enthousiasmant et rassurant sur l'avenir et notre capacité à financer le, le développement. Donc la question de la mobilisation, elle est absolument stratégique. Et au niveau national, Cécile l'a mentionné également dans son introduction, elle a commencé très tôt, après la COP21, avec la demande qui a été faite à l'AFD, de se focaliser sur, euh, enfin d'être de, 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 aligné avec l'accord de Paris. Et donc de poser en quelque sorte les bases d'une standardisation dans nos méthodes de comptabilisation de nos investissements dans le domaine de la lutte contre le changement climatique, en cohérence avec l'accord international qui encore aujourd'hui fait référence en matière de lutte contre le changement climatique, qui est l'accord de Paris. Donc ça c'est une première brique à l'échelon national, et aujourd'hui l'État français nous encourage à aller plus loin puisqu'il y a des discussions qui ont lieu depuis maintenant quelques années sur une réflexion sur la prise en compte des objectifs de développement durable et ce que veut dire, ce que va vouloir dire à l'avenir d'être aligné sur les objectifs de développement durable pour une institution comme la nôtre. Et il me semble que la question 
La question est posée euh, à de nombreux bailleurs euh, du développement, également je pense euh, aux EDFIs. Elle est absolument clé dans notre capacité à nous mobiliser, à définir des standards, des normes communes, et puis à un moment à attirer des investisseurs privés qui vont soit définir eux-mêmes les normes en matière d'investissement durable, mais du coup c'est un problème pour nous, banques publiques, dont les États sont des actionnaires, parce que c'est le secteur privé qui, en fonction de ses propres intérêts, va définir les normes et les standards de l'investissement, ou alors, à l'autre bout du spectre, c'est nous, acteurs, ce sont les États et leurs institutions publiques qui vont définir ces standards, et c'est avec une demande très forte du secteur privé, et c'est ça qui doit nous amener, je crois, c'est la direction dans laquelle nous devons aller collectivement. Et donc l'intérêt du sommet finance en commun auquel San, encore une fois, vous avez participé, c'est bien de réunir les banques publiques de la planète. Nous en avons identifié 520, elles représentent 12% de l'investissement mondial annuel pour eh bien, parler des mandats d'intervention de ces institutions, qu'elles soient en Asie, qu'elles soient en Amérique latine, qu'elles soient en Afrique ou qu'elles soient en Europe et voir comment on peut amener ces institutions à parler mandat, à structurer des mandats d'intervention et à organiser un dialogue avec leurs actionnaires, les États, réunis dans des enceintes qui peuvent être le G7, le G20 ou des enceintes beaucoup plus larges, avec notamment une représentation des Nations Unies à l'occasion de ce sommet finance en commun qui montre in fine l'ambition que nous voulons avoir à travers une mobilisation globale des institutions publiques de l'ensemble des pays de la, de la planète. Aligner les mandats, trouver les secteurs d'intervention qui font le plus cohérence aujourd'hui, c'était particulièrement vrai il y a deux ans maintenant dans le secteur de la santé, c'est pleinement d'actualité aujourd'hui dans le secteur de l'alimentation et de l'agroalimentaire, et c'est évidemment absolument indispensable dans le secteur climatique. Donc comment est-ce qu'on travaille, comment est-ce qu'on mobilise nos instruments, et puis peut-être, puisque vous avez mentionné ça, ce point dans votre introduction, à un moment, est-ce que ces institutions publiques peuvent être les récipiendaires, de manière directe ou sans doute plutôt indirecte, mais peuvent bénéficier de l'effet de levier que pourrait avoir l'attribution, par exemple, de DTS, de droits de tirage spéciaux du FMI, à des institutions multilatérales de développement Parce que c'est aussi ça la force des institutions publiques et des banques publiques de développement, c'est d'être présentes dans un pays avec un mandat qui leur est confié par leur gouvernement et d'avoir une... Une, une capacité d'action et une connaissance de l'environnement dans lequel elles, elles interviennent, beaucoup plus fine que celle que nous, euh, acteurs du développement étant euh, implantés euh, en Europe, euh, pouvons euh, avoir. Donc ça, c'est un enjeu en matière de mobilisation qui me paraît très significatif. Et puis le deuxième enjeu sur lequel euh, il me semble que la communauté internationale est en train de, de travailler à, à marche forcée, c'est évidemment la question euh, de la mobilisation du secteur euh, privé. Euh, cela a été rappelé par Bruno dans son propos. La, la, la blended finance, la, la, les financements euh, mixtes sont aujourd'hui très complexes pour être mis en œuvre. Donc, des institutions comme l'AFD, comme la KFW, comme la PEI, comme la BERD sont évidemment capables de mobiliser ces instruments. Évidemment, beaucoup plus difficile pour des petites entreprises, sachant que, in fine, les créations d'emplois de manière très significative, en Afrique en particulier, viendront des TPE et des PME dans les années, dans les 15, 20, 25, 30, 50 ans à venir. Donc il est absolument clé que nous soyons capables, en tant qu'institution de développement européenne, bénéficiaire un jour de garanties dans le cadre de la mise en œuvre du NDQ et de subventions européennes. Il est absolument clé que nous soyons capables de travailler à un niveau d'investissement et à un niveau de granularité qui nous permettent de mobiliser quelques dizaines de milliers d'euros pour financer, investir, prêter, garantir les activités de euh, très petites entreprises et de euh, small and medium companies. Donc ça, c'est absolument clé dans le développement des économies dans lesquelles nous investissons et en cadre des partenariats que nous voulons mettre, mettre en place. Enfin, euh, un dernier enjeu qui a également déjà été euh, un petit peu euh, évoqué, c'est la question de la structuration au niveau européen des différents réseaux que nous représentons. Donc le réseau des ZFI est l'un des trois grands réseaux européens euh, aujourd'hui. Il existe également le Practitioners Network, 
qui rassemble les institutions comme euh, Expertise France ou la GIZ ou euh, Luxdev ou euh, Enabel. Il est fort d'une vingtaine, euh, un peu plus de 20 euh, adhérents euh, aujourd'hui. Et puis, euh, San, Bruno, vous les avez euh, mentionnés, c'est le travail que nous faisons en tant que banque publique de développement. La Casa des Depositi en Italie, la KFW en, Al en Allemagne, l'AFD en France, AECID en Espagne, que de structurer une plateforme, JFIC, elle a été mentionnée, pour simplifier vis-à-vis -vis de nos clients, vis-à-vis -vis de nos contreparties, la façon dont nous nous mobilisons pour financer leur, leurs investissements, pour financer leur développement. Et donc ça, c'est évidemment un travail très structurant, puisque nous avons l'ambition de développer beaucoup plus avant qu'elle n'existe aujourd'hui cette plateforme collective de financement, petit 1. Petit 2, c'est également un enjeu important pour nous, puisque nous avons à terme l'ambition de pouvoir collectivement mobiliser des financements européens pour nous accompagner dans les investissements que nous réalisons dans les pays en développement. C'est un point important, le travail que nous faisons avec la Commission européenne, avec la DG INFA et avec la DG NIR, doit nous aider à mobiliser plus simplement les financements européens, mettre en œuvre le NDK, puisque le NDK a une trajectoire 2021-2027. Nous sommes maintenant presque à la fin de l'année 2022 et nous sommes dans les toutes dernières étapes pour la mobilisation des premières garanties qui nous permettront d'intervenir dans les pays avec lesquels l'Union européenne a décidé de créer un partenariat politique très fort et très structurant. Voilà les messages que je souhaitais passer dans le cadre de cette introduction. Donc encore une fois, un contexte macroéconomique très singulier et très particulier en cette fin d'année 2022, qui soulève de nombreuses questions sur notre capacité et nos modalités d'intervention en 2023. Ça, c'est le premier point. Le deuxième point, c'est celui de la structuration d'un agenda européen politique extrêmement ambitieux avec la mise en œuvre du NDK, avec la mobilisation des réseaux Practitioners Network, JFIC et EDFI, euh, extrêmement euh, structurants sur notre capacité à accompagner les pays dans lesquels euh, nous investissons. Un troisième point qui est celui de la stratégie et des objectifs stratégiques de la politique mondiale de développement, qui encore une fois, il y a maintenant une trentaine d'années, a fait la somme des deux grands objectifs que sont la lutte contre la pauvreté et la lutte contre le changement climatique, et une question qui se pose aujourd'hui sur les, la, la bonne façon de comptabiliser la mobilisation des acteurs privés au regard de ces deux euh, politiques. Et puis enfin, un troisième point qui est la question de la mobilisation. Comment est-ce qu'à travers les réseaux à la fois des bandes publiques, mais également des acteurs euh, privés, nous arrivons à, à travers des actions comme la création de standards partagés au niveau européen, voire euh, mondial Comment est-ce que nous arrivons à inciter les acteurs privés à nous accompagner, à nous suivre dans le financement du développement Je vous remercie. C'est nous qui vous remercions, Bertrand, pour cette approche à la fois très spécifique, mais qui part d'une vision globale et mondiale qui est vraiment, qui est vraiment nécessaire. Donc, c'est encourageant. Je me tourne maintenant uh, towards uh, Lionel Rapai, who is the director for neighboring countries at EIB Global. And I know you're under, I'm sorry, I know you're under time pressure because you have to leave us early. So sorry that uh, it took us so much time. I still hope you have a few minutes with us to share some of your uh, key insights, given that uh, EIB is the uh, EU bank, the EU climate bank, and now there's EIB Global that is. Uh, Uh, also leading the activities outside the, the EU uh, and has a clear role to play in this effort. Uh, Lionel? Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Uh, no, thank you very much uh, for inviting EIB Global to this, uh, to this important panel. Uh, well, certainly, I will be, go a bit faster than, uh, than, uh, than expected. Uh, no, definitely, I think this is a very timely discussion that uh, you are uh, organizing, leading now. I mean, in view of the challenges uh, which were mentioned by uh, By, by the colleagues, uh, but also in view of this important multilateral events which are taking place in recent weeks and upcoming weeks. I mean, the Finance and Common Summit was mentioned. We have in a bit more than two weeks from now the COP27 in Charmanshire. So I think it's very relevant to have this type of exchanges uh, now. Uh, I mean, clearly, it was mentioned uh, the, the world is uh, 
facing momentous challenges now. Uh, of course, uh, the pandemic, the Russian aggression against Ukraine, with all the pain and devastation it leads it creates in the country, and all the multiple consequences: uh, food, energy security, inflationary pressure, disruption of value chain. And this comes on top of, I would say, the longer term uh, looming, let's say, uh, issues, and of course, one of first most, uh, the, the climate crisis. But in parallel of this, and it was very well explained by Bertrand, I think we are at a stage where the means to address these challenges are eroded. Uh, clearly, I mean, governments, public bodies had already to tackle challenges in the last few years uh, and had already some vulnerabilities. So rising indebtedness, uh, Difficulty, of course, to uh, to 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 address uh, increased debt servicing costs uh, makes it very challenging. On top of that, you have tightening financing conditions. The spreads are increasing, uh, interest rates of from central banks are increasing. So you have this combination of increased challenges, and at the same time, let's say less room to maneuver by the by by governments. So clearly in this context, I mean, Europe must rise to these uh, challenges and do uh, whatever it can uh, in an effective and focused approach. The needs are clearly enormous. Huh? If I take the example of Ukraine, uh, Ukraine to cover its deficits requires three to four billion euro per month. If you look at the recovery needs, so it was an estimate by the World Bank and the Commission released in September, it needs more than 105 billion euros over the next two to three years. If you compare this to the financing mobilized by, for instance, EIB, BRD, World Bank all together in one single year, it was approximately 3 billion per year. So you can see that there is a big mismatch uh, between the potential firepower uh, of the past and, and what is currently needed. So on all these challenges, we need concerted efforts. Uh, we need, it was mentioned, to include the private sector, and we need to come up with innovative solutions where, where possible. Now, I just would like to explain briefly uh, three things. One is how EIB Global responded to the current challenges we have, and perhaps draw some lessons from this uh, recent experience. Uh, second, come back to the topic of partnership, and, and of course, how we can act as, a, as Team Europe. And third, uh, to have some, uh, let's say, uh, more general challenges which we still see ahead. So, if I look at how we addressed uh, the main crisis recently, and I, I will just take uh, start with Ukraine. Well, just a few days after the invasion, 24th of February, the bank mobilized nearly 700 million euros, which were made available in March for Ukraine to meet the immediate financing needs. In July, we approved the second financing package of 1.6 billion. Uh, which are basically used to already start reconstructing the transport networks uh, to enable municipalities to go through the upcoming winter. The, the lesson from this is that financing institutions, EU financing institutions, needs to be very agile and reactive and not hesitate to push the limits of what we think is possible. Uh, Clearly here, we were able, together with uh, colleagues from the European Commission, uh, and when support from our board, to, to come up with uh, immediate solutions which are, let's say, beyond the standard approach which we would take. <laughs> now, on Ukraine, we are actively working now on, uh, on the broader recovery and reconstruction efforts. Uh, and whereas I think that the first support which was provided over the last eight months was not fully coordinated or not in an optimal manner, I think now is the time to create a platform uh, to have institutions, G7 members, EU, uh, to, to work on the reconstruction of Ukraine. And actually, I'm about to leave in a few minutes uh, to Berlin to go to the, to the G7 EU conference on, on Ukraine. Uh, other challenges, of course, are related to food security, energy security, so the disruption of, of value chains. If we take the example of the food security, here, from the EIB perspective, we have, uh, let's say, proposed and, and let's say, designed projects uh, with some of the impacted countries to tackle both the immediate consequences of the crisis. So, of course, the difficulty of supply, uh, the increased prices in, uh, in, let's say, in commodities, but at the same time, improve the resilience of the food supply system. 
So an important work has been done uh, together with other team Europe partners and, uh, and notably uh, AFD to work on construction, refurbishment of storage, uh, introducing the digital solutions. So I think the key aspect here is to consider this crisis, of course, in a responsive mode, but at the same time to address long-term challenges and, of course, to make more resilience uh, these economies and, and the societies in which we, we intervene. Uh, last, uh, last element I will mention, and, and here more are, the, of course, uh, growing uh, crisis, uh, which is related to climate change. So from the IAB perspective, I mean, we, uh, we, are on a, we, we are clearly indicated as the EU climate bank that we would uh, accelerate uh, our activities in that field. I mean, we are uh, stepping up our, our support. So as part of our climate bank roadmap, we announced uh, that we would trigger 1 trillion of investment uh, until uh, 2030, and we will dedicate 50% of our financing to green investments. But beyond this aspect, uh, a particular emphasis is put currently on adaptation, uh, and in particular in, uh, in our activities of EIB Global, it's absolutely critical to support the resilience of uh, our partner countries uh, and, and, let's say, increase this effort on climate adaptation, uh, which is, to a certain extent, less addressed, less tackled by, uh, by financing partners. And linked to this, and perhaps I would echo uh, somehow this dimension of development versus climate. I mean, we have done quite lots of work in the course of this year to have a holistic approach to accelerate climate action, but alongside the pursuit of sustainable development goals. So this concept of just transition, uh, which is already well established in, in the EU uh, and notably in the in most impacted regions, uh, I mean, needs to be expanded and further defined outside the EU, and this is a work which is uh, which is ongoing. A few words about uh, partnership uh, and, and, of course, uh, the Team Europe uh, approach, uh, which uh, which is uh, now implemented. And I must say, as EIB Global, I mean, we are uh, eager to you know to, to learn, share, and and, and further develop this uh, this approach. In a way, I mean, working together, and we know this, uh, enables to leverage different expertise, different capacities uh, that we all have uh, as EU, uh, EU institutions, EU member states. Uh, and therefore, it's essential to continue, um, let's say, improving and enhancing this, uh, this mechanism, this setup. Uh, well, from the IAB perspective, I mean, in a way, this collaborative approach, it's in our DNA. Huh? By construction, uh, we can not finance more than 50% of any given investment any given operation so we always team up with uh, with uh, with partners now within team europe initiative i mean this is a concept which we have fully embraced uh, so we participate in approximately two-thirds of the team europe initiatives uh, and i think we very much value the impact that we can have jointly uh, by of course coming with additional means uh, and, and to have let's say uh, policy priority objectives, which are clearly followed jointly and not in a scattered approach. Uh, the visibility dimension, which is essential, I think, for the, for the EU. And last but not least, the effectiveness. And if I focus on the effectiveness, uh, I think it's important also to consider the operational dimension of this coordination. Um, we have this in place, I mean, this mutual reliance mechanism uh, with, uh, with European partners, which has been in place for a long time with AFT or, or KFW. Uh, we have just established a new uh, framework cooperation agreement with EBRD. Uh, we know is here and it's familiar with the uh, European financing partners um, in place with EDFIs, which enables to leverage commitment support through all uh, European institutions. So I think it's also important to have the strategic dimension, uh, the, the coordinated approach, but also, uh, of course, the very operational dimension of this uh, Team Europe, uh, let's say, uh, setup. Perhaps going beyond this, uh, two, two elements I would add on, uh, on the partnership. Um, certainly, it's important to engage with all European uh, national promotional banks and institutions. Um, so we have, let's say, the usual circles, but it's 
essential for us to, uh, to try as much as possible to bring in uh, other partners and in some cases, uh, let's say, smaller financing institutions from, from member states, which are interesting to support uh, development uh, activities. Um, I will just give the example of a project which we recently developed in, in Jordan, uh, where we are working with, of course, the Commission, AFD, KFV, but as well Netherlands, Italy, Spain. So just to bring the, the full European dimension around the same, same project. And linked to this, and it was uh, mentioned by Bruno, uh, certainly the importance to have an inclusive approach with the like-minded partner countries. Um, so, of course, we need to work as European, but engage uh, in a, let's say, very, very coherent manner uh, with UN institutions, with other MTBs, and, and more generally with G7. And, and here I think that Ukraine is a very good uh, and interesting case. Just to conclude, uh, to conclude very briefly, perhaps on two, uh, two uh, or three, let's say, elements which were partially mentioned, but I would like to, to underline. Uh, one, of course, is the need to uh, bring more actively the private sector uh, to, uh, let's say, to support our uh, actions. So I think some recommendations which were made, uh, notably to make sure that we have a value proposition which is attractive for private investors, essentials, uh, to work with common standards for the private sectors and not to come up with different languages is, is absolutely key. The second aspect is that we talk a lot about increasing commitment, but I think equally important is speed. So I think, yes, we need to increase the leverage. We want to have the level of the volumes of commitment, but accelerating the implementation of projects, the preparation of projects, and notably through uh, advisory support is, uh, is equally essential. And last but not least, perhaps we talk a lot about Team Europe, uh, but in all cases, we need to have a firm national ownership and leadership on the programs, the projects that we propose. Uh, so, so here, I think it's important that we reach common goals together with partner countries, and we clearly align what we intend to do with national priorities and development plans. So thank you very much again, Sam. Yeah, no, thanks a lot. And, and I know uh, you have to go also, you told me you have to go earlier. Perhaps just one point I wanted to, to get back to you, especially when you talk about, uh, you know, your last point about uh, uh, the need for more commitments, but also speed of implementation. You have this uh, partnership platform for funds, which seems to me the ideal type of instrument to bring different donors uh, together to, to, to allow you to leverage some of the activities. And the EBRD as the multi, uh, multi donor funds that is exactly also doing the same. And I hear from the EBRD that's, uh, I think, and correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, but, but that's the EBRD has received quite a lot of direct funds from donors. I'm not sure that has been yet the case in response to Ukraine. I'm not sure that is that yet the case for the EIB. And is that not perhaps a way to also think in addition to the EU budget, or perhaps in, in cooperation with the EU budget, to a way to, uh, to accelerate the response to Ukraine and perhaps beyond? No, thank you very much. And indeed, I think it's very complementary in a way uh, to what can be done through uh, new budgets, through specific mandates uh, that we, we may have. Uh, we operate already some trust funds for the Med regions, for the Eastern Partnership, uh, and, and which are extremely successful. So in a way, this is a very good framework to strengthen the Team Europe approach. Uh, but in a, let's say, direct manner with EU member states or other contributors. So in a way, uh, it's very flexible, uh, and certainly this can be boosted and expanded in view of current challenges. And in particular, in the case of Ukraine, this is something which, uh, which we are currently discussing. And perhaps, thanks a lot, and perhaps it would be interesting to consider, you know, how you could use either with EBRD or with uh, others, you know, kind of collective bots that it's not just uh, you have one for EBRD, one for EIB, and the other DFIs or, or, or I mean, we're talking about inclusiveness. So it would be interesting to think perhaps how these frameworks can also lead to, to inclusiveness. Thanks a lot. So we are now not getting uh, with the people online, but with the people who kindly join us. Uh, I was uh, supposed to be surrounded by women. And so I have to thank these uh, very kind gentlemen to have uh,
to have <laughs> substituted them come, uh, you know, at the request of the uh, the ladies I had invited them could not, <laughs> could not join. And so these the ladies who, who were, so I didn't mean to have a physical panel, <laughs> a panel, sorry. But uh, uh, thank you very much for, for joining us and, and uh, Kate for stepping in since <laughs> I think we just had exchange on Friday because uh, Marietta Yeager had uh, certainly uh, an emergency and couldn't come in. So thanks a lot for, for stepping in and for sharing with us some of your views. Yeah, I apologize for the disappointment of not being a woman and not being a yet. Um, look, I, I mean, there, there's a lot of space covered by the uh, by the previous speakers, and uh, I mean, there's nothing to, to disagree with their analysis. Uh, obviously, um, uh, let me not to talk too long, also, but let me let me go back to Sun, uh, to your uh, initial uh, talk, which was basically um, making a case the way I took it for. Uh, more innovative approaches to mobilizing investment for development, right? And okay, I have a vested interest here. I'm running a unit for investment <laughs> and innovative financing in, in DG Infra. Uh, so I have a vested interest in, in subscribing to this notion. Um, there's a bit of rain on that parade, obviously, um, coming from um, what you might consider, or hopefully, short term challenges uh, such as Ukraine, country at war, that is not a, a good environment, obviously, for investment. Uh, an incip incipient debt crisis, uh, where again, um, at the head of the EIB, Van Oye was making just the opposite case. Huh? And, uh, a couple of days ago, in, uh, in an article saying that it is now that we have to invest, and if we wait until uh, the end of the war, the costs of investment will be even much higher. I'm coming there. I'm coming oh, okay, there. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, but I think we have to acknowledge that, that, that there are challenges that are short term that, I mean, need us to look more in a more nuanced way at, uh, at investment. But, uh, and I think that's, uh, I think the long-term analysis remains out there, uh, that the big investments that we, we need in uh, climate, in infrastructure, in supporting the private sector in our countries, arguably even in uh, healthcare, uh, education, at least parts of it. Uh, this is just about investment and, and it's about huge amounts of investment. Uh, that we as public donors uh, are not able to make on our own, which is why this mobilization uh, and this obviously this old uh, billions to trillions uh, notion, uh, in my view, remains extremely important. Uh, and I think the, the colleagues from XE, AFD and so on have, have fundamentally supported, supported that notion. I mean, it's really about investment and how to mobilize as much as possible of it. And I think, Sam, that was what your talk uh, was, uh, was really about. Um, now, um, what are the uh, recent learnings, let's say, from uh, EFSD, now moving into a much larger uh, EFSD plus? Uh, Bruno mentioned a few, obviously, um, keeping it simple, uh, having effective governance around it. Um, and, and it's true that um, simple things work more simply, complicated things are more complicated and, and they take longer uh, to make work, uh, but they also potentially have a very uh, high payoff. Um, so I think a two-pronged approach remains important, uh, that is to uh, deploy on the one hand simple mechanisms that have uh, shown to work uh, and that can then be standardized and scaled up. Uh, and I think we, we're seeing a lot of that coming out of uh, out of ECFI, out of uh, EBRD, ERB, and so on. Um, so, so I think a lot of that is happening, and we're we're going to support that. Uh, so. um, then on the complex side, Asan, you mentioned uh, uh, securitization, um, co-investment, and so on. Uh, I mean, I think IFC took four or five years setting up the, the uh, MCPT, this Managed Co-Financing Partnership mm -hmm. Program for Institutional Investors. Um, they now have a product that can be uh, replicated and, and uh, churned out on an, on an ongoing basis. Um, and there are other, uh, more of these instruments that you mentioned that, that at least potentially have a very powerful uh, mobilization impact, uh, where, as you say, um, development banks would focus on uh, sort of the sharp end of uh, developing uh, projects, financing them, uh, but then recycling them once they have become uh, cash flow generating uh, assets, where it might be painful for them to get rid of them when they're nice and uh, 
Oh, they said they need guarantees and they need to use the sweetening for, for the private sector. Exactly, but that's why we're there. That's, that's, why, why, that's precisely right. why we're there, right? Um, so, but that is to say, um, mobilization, simple approaches, but also making the investment in, thing, in things that, that have the potential to work at scale. And I think there are some examples that, uh, that have worked and are worth investing, um, investing in. Um, then, uh, I mean, on the governance that several people mentioned, uh, yes, we have the ETSI, we have the, um, the new JEFIC. I heard they couldn't call it, they had to call it like that, otherwise it would have been ETSI as well, the, uh, the acronym. So it's kind of backwards, but, uh, but these are important, uh, uh, of course, elements of governance. But let's not forget, I mean, EBRD works on a pan-European basis and EIB itself, in a way, is, a, uh, is an aggregator, uh, certainly as far as we are concerned. Because there, I mean, especially now EIB Global, I mean, there's certainly the bank that uh, is most deeply integrated in, in, in our governance. And that's, of course, helpful uh, for us uh, as Commission. Um, since when you talk about collaborative pots of money, uh, we're a big collaborative uh, pot. Um, but um, it would be important, of course, to um, develop the notion of Team Europe. Uh, so that it also acts as uh, not just um, sort of a point for, for DFIs to coalesce around projects, uh, but also to, uh, to harness funding, not just from the EU, but also from, uh, from member states. So Team Europe is moving in the right direction, but is perhaps not quite there yet uh, as a full aggregator of, uh, of not only Commission, but also member state funding. Um, so, yeah, Bruno's point about oh, obviously we're not the most, <laughs> not always the most uh, simplification minded people when it comes to results, manner, uh, uh, measurement, harmonization and so on, but we're, uh, we're certainly working on it. Uh, and I think again, um, all the work that we have invested in the last three years, uh, now is really uh, the moment to make it pay off uh, by using what works and then uh, scaling it up. And we really have this unique, unique opportunity. Of, uh, of scaling up now. Um, and then, of course, we have the, uh, the part that's a bit trickier, country at war, uh, uh, countries in debt distress, where um, I guess grant funding sometimes is needed and uh, um, where some of the Americans seem to be faster. I don't know if they're just faster in communicating, but uh, they, they seem to be faster in putting big numbers out there. So uh, that, that's what this is. No, I chance, okay, great. Any chance that uh, the, the guarantees that you're managing could be increased, that you would receive contributions by member states? Because one of my points was that for member states that have limited aid allocation, yeah. you know, they should perhaps reallocate some of their development uh, budgets to tools that can catalyze funding. So one way would be to, as I was suggesting, either to work with the ERD, BRD, another way would be to to provide additional funding to the guarantees so you can do more at the EU level? Is there any discussion around that? Or? I mean, that would be by far the best and most effective way of doing this. So do you have any any so, member states that, I mean, is that things that, you know, are, could be considered by some member states or is it for the time being not on the table? No, no, it's not at all off the table, especially since member states are still allowed to come in, uh, you know, senior above yes. everybody else. Uh, so it remains attractive. Uh, I mean, in EFSD, as you know, it was mostly the Gates Foundation that contributed. Um, member states were much smaller, uh, smaller. I mean, I don't want to diminish. <laughs> so perhaps something to consider for. Uh, absolutely. Plus. Uh, yes, thank you, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I'm trying to put, because in these discussions, we always put the commission at the heart. And in a sense, I mean, I understand the, the, your framework, but you're also extremely, I mean, not you, but I mean, the whole system is, is very slow because, I mean, in fact, the implementation of the FSD Plus will come, uh, you know, you will, you will, by the end of the year, you'll go through all the proposals and by mid of next year, you will hopefully be able to start with the first the first proposal, no implementation. Is that the, the time timetable? Uh, that's about it. Well, people always say we're slow. Uh, slow. I mentioned the IPs and PPP. I mean, they took really until the first one was signed. How long did they take? Three, four years. Yeah, that's that's why I was not saying. So it's not like we're the only ones who are slow. I think. But the, the framework is yeah. slow, so that means that we have crisis and we 
by the time we put things in place, it's not before the mid of 2023 or, or end of 2023 that we'll see some of the first results when you will start the midterm evaluation when they will just start implementation. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit this mismatch between the crisis. You know, looking from the outside, there's this mismatch between the crisis and the speed at which some institutions can respond to the immediate needs. But perhaps yeah. although no, let, let's no? say something uh, because once these instruments are up and running, I mean, let's not forget in. Uh, COVID, we were really fast in uh, setting up uh, front loading for, for the COVAX initiative. Obviously, we are much faster than all the donors, otherwise, <laughs> the front loading wouldn't have added anything. Uh, we were very fast in uh, bringing out um, uh, financing, like short term financing for SMEs. I mean, w once these instruments are up and running, they, they actually work really exactly. fast. Yeah. Good point taken. Uh, Johannes, uh, Schotten, you come from uh, E3G, a leading, leading uh, think tank and institution on, on, on climate uh, finance mainly. What are some of your, I, I know we're a bit taken by, by time, so yeah. what are some of your, some of your uh, takeaway and perhaps uh, people on, online and in the audience, we can perhaps extend by five, ten minutes to have just a bit of interaction, but um, what are some of your key takeaway from, from this discussion uh, and including also between this dilemma or this dual approach between climate finance and development finance. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank you very much for raising the point on the manual. I was about to apologize. Uh, yeah, my colleague Leah Pilsner couldn't hear me, fortunately, so I had to <laughs> substitute her today. Um, thank you for doing, for substituting. Um, yeah, no, I, I think, so we already raised the, the, the multiplicity of the crisis a couple of times today, and I think what that implies is it also uh, requires a coherent approach to address those. Um, my impression is, if we look at uh, that, this is not necessarily the case already. And what I would like what I would like to raise here is, I think we need to be more coherent in terms of what we're doing on, on, on our trade policy and our development policy, and indeed also the climate policy. If we look at the targets that the EU has set itself, climate neutrality by 2050, they won't won't be able to achieve that by its own. It will be dependent on other parts of the world, provide the energy, um, provide the markets for, for climate neutral product, products, etc. And so I think the, the key point here is to really sort of look at the nexus of these um, aspects. And I think that that has been already raised today a couple of times. So Europe is a very good uh, example on that. I think the Global Gateway is very, it's a key element in that. But I think what is still a bit missing is the question of how much, and I think you raised that, is actually additional finance. What is actually a, how does the Global Gateway distinguish itself from other parts of development finance, right? Is it this very strong infrastructure focus? Can you embed that into trade policies? Um, and I think looking at that, the key point I would raise here is, um, the EU needs to make itself a little bit more honest. If we, you, you know, you have you have things like the uh, CBAM, uh, which is not necessarily perceived particularly well in in local South countries. Uh, right now, the EU is buying up more or less the entire LNG markets uh, for very good reasons. But of course, these things have direct implications for uh, these regions in terms of you know rising energy prices and the, the concern around uh, food security, etc. So these things have to go have to go together. There's some, like really a cascade of sort of a domino effect that's happening there. Uh, and if we don't, if, if the EU is not able to present itself with a positive offer towards the rest of the world, sort of you know accompanying these challenges around uh, uh, the energy crisis, around sort of protecting domestic industry in its transition, which I think is very fair and justified, uh, then we're going to be in um, face problems. And this is, I think, where the, the, the financing model of the European Union comes in, right? And that is indeed the development finance institutions, the development finance uh, network that the EU boasts. And uh, I'm talking in particular also, of course, the member states here, KFW, AFD, we already heard. Um, but I think what's still missing there is a common narrative, a an element of joint saying, look, this is the European Union providing investment, coming in, providing high quality infrastructure projects, providing perhaps also policy support that is sort of creating a long-term effect of these infrastructure projects in terms of and also development finance, of course. So, you know, I don't think these things are mutually exclusive. I think somebody raised the point on sort of, you know, 
development versus climate. I think we also heard already about the co-benefits. I think I would add another perspective there, and this is really this question around what there is also a, re, a real political element in that. There is an element of the EU is also dependent on the success of these projects in terms of being able to sustain itself in, with energy supplies, etc. And bringing that in, I think that automatically raises the political stakes and therefore also the ability of the EU to act quickly and come in with more projects and be able to provide more financial resources. Because let's face it, at the end of the day, ODA is always limited because it does not necessarily has this transactional character. And I think that's where, as I said, the EU must make steps honest that next to ODA, which I think shouldn't be touched at all. And things like adaptation, things, things like the loss and damage initiative from Denmark are absolutely crucial. But at the same time, there has to be sort of a parallel track, which is sort of more embedded in the, the geopolitical struggles that we're having at the moment. And that is, uh, uh, you know, providing high quality infrastructure finance, making sure that this is embedded into an honest trade policy, which says, look, we will need you, you will need us. And then finally, um, um, of course, also in the sense of, you know, uh, well, access to, to markets and uh, let's face it, there's a big question around, sort of, you know, Global Gateway being a counter narrative to other uh, infrastructure finance initiatives from countries that uh, are maybe a bit more centralized. Than but for the time being, this is not a parallel track. This is the same track of no, Global of Gateways relying only on ODA. One of my questions was perhaps, is that a mistake to try to have only one source of funding, ODA, to, to pursue, yeah. in fact, something that is as a development objective, but as perhaps something beyond development. I think it's a very valid question. Objective, and then there should be perhaps other public finance instruments, but that are not ODA yeah. to accompany the uh, global gateway. Yeah, I think I think that's exactly the right question. I mean, I'm I, I, I can't stand here and say, look, we're going to add another fifty billion, but that would be fantastic, of course. Um, I mean, I think it, it is quite crucial that the European Union is distinguishing itself from other infrastructure finance initiatives out there. That means, you know, you have to maintain high quality standards. There has to be an element of sort of, you know, civil engagement on the ground so that you don't, you know, come up with th these kind of things are, are need to be maintained. Um, but of course, if you announce Global Gateway as, you know, there's going to be 300 billion in new investment and then partner countries realize, oh, actually, it's been projects that have already been done maybe two years ago, but they are being relabeled now as Global Gateway projects that will raise some serious questions. So bringing in some kind of new investment, some kind of new ability to fund, and I know that resources are scarce, that is absolutely essential. Um, and, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm from Germany, we just made available 200 billion to uh, the Account of domestic needs, you know, the, the social impacts. You, you already mentioned the debt crisis in the global south. Um, I think there's a very serious question of how much will Europe be forgiven in terms of, you know, very much caring for its own right now and not being able to sort of project something which is sort of going to help in the in the medium to long term uh, those countries which are going to heavily struggle now and don't have the financial means necessary to, um, well, yeah, counter that double crisis of energy crisis. Food crisis and the climate crisis all coming together. Yeah. So let me turn. That's a perfect transition to uh, Jeroen, uh, Jeroen Krakenbos, who is the deputy head of the EU office and the senior aid policy and development finance advisor at Oxfam. So when we talk about developments and you know what is the perspective, Oxfam is definitely there. Well, what are your views, Jeroen? You have been following this for for years. What, what do you think we're at and where, in which direction should we be going? Well, I was hoping to provide some solutions, um, so I'll try my best. Um, I think one of the things you point out quite well in the paper that you're developing in your presentation is that one of the challenges that the EU faces in mobilizing more resources is that the EU is essentially on a fixed income. So how do you get more out of a fixed income? Um, and I have six potential proposals here. I uh, will go through them quite quickly because we're totally out of time. Um, so the first, uh, I, I you know the first three are probably small potatoes and have to do more with the Team Europe approach and with the discussion we've been having here. Um, the first is about efficiency gains through defra defragmentation, consolidation, and harmonization. Most of us are talking about the same donor pools when we talk about the ETFs, about the MDPs. Surely there are some resources that could be freed up through more efficiency gains through effective harmonization and defragmentation. Now this is not new. This refers essentially to the aid effectiveness policies, uh, uh, the aid effectiveness process and principles, which were first developed in 2005 and poorly implemented since then. So there is something that we can learn from the past, and this could easily free up some more resources for development investments. 
Two, fresh money from the member states. The easiest way to get more money for the EU is if the EU gets more money from its member states. As discussed, that seems incredibly unlikely. Um, however, we should continue pushing for it, and we have to also make a value case for why we should give the EU more money as opposed to allow the member states to engage in the individualistic, uh, individualistic <laughs> fashion they have been through their development cooperation agencies. Uh, the third is a bit what Kay was talking about, which is we have to find a significant lever for private sector investment. Um, however, um, as noted before, the more you mobilize, there's almost an inverse relationship to development impact, which means that we're kind of in a catch-22 where we need a lot more money. However, the more money raised, the less impactful it will be. So that means we need to be better about impact, we need to be better about mobilization, and we need to be better about absorbing the kind of risk that would actually see investment in the world's poorest countries that would actually meet the needs of the world's poorest people. Now, in terms of big money, um, so these are more things that can free up fiscal space in partner countries and can lead to significant savings and significant investment opportunities by partner countries themselves. So the first is debt cancellation and debt relief. Debt servicing is currently at twice the level of ODA from countries on the DAC recipients list. That means that for every one euro of ODA that goes to partner countries, two comes out in debt servicing. Um, this is also the case for LDCs, but this is just probably the case for mixed lists and across the board which means that no matter how fast we try and fill the bucket, the hole is bigger. Um, and we have to be able to stop that hole if we want to fill the bucket. The second is SDRs. Uh, the 650 billion issuance was fantastic. It was wonderful. It was a step forward in the right direction. However, the IMF quota system means that perversely, most of the SDRs went to the countries that need them the least. The commitment by Emmanuel Macron and by the G20 and the leadership under Macron to transfer 100 billion to partner countries was absolutely fantastic. However, the EU cannot seem to get out of its own way in doing this, and it needs to be better about this. The fact that we have to create the RST in order to create a new vehicle to transfer these resources is ludicrous. I mean, there's no reason we shouldn't be able to give them directly to our partners and directly to uh, MDBs without some kind of arcane uh, central bank uh, ish, uh, 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 ruling saying that this is simply not possible. So there has to be a way to do this. Otherwise, we're just wasting time. And finally, illicit financial flows. This is once again about plugging the leaks. There is so much money that is going through uh, tax avoidance and tax evasion from partner countries to the global north that is almost useless to talk about increasing this, the amount of money going to there if we do not decrease the amount of money that is escaping there. We should probably do a, a, a netting of the amount of money that goes to poor countries from rich countries and the amount of money that goes from poor countries to rich countries, so rich countries to poor countries and from poor countries to rich countries. And I think that you'll find that across the board, rich countries are the largest recipients of resources from poor countries. And this is a pretty ridiculous situation to be in. And I think that if we had actual real figures on that and we could figure out how to stop that, then we could have a real discussion about how do we increase the amount of development finance that's going to these countries. Um, so the main challenge to all of these things is that the leadership needs to come from the member states. Um, I recall at the beginning of the crisis, uh, Commissioner Erpelainen was quite vocal about the need for debt relief and about the need for a good way to transfer SDRs. And she mobilized the development ministers from the different member states. And they were, they were excited and they were very, very keen to do this kind of stuff. And then the finance ministers and the central bankers basically said, get off our patch. And that was the end of that discussion. And then it went down to the national level. And now we've seen almost no movement on any of these things, aside from some uh, bilateral initiatives, primarily led by France, which is uh, fantastic to see. Um, but once again, we cannot seem to get out of our way in a lot of these things. The DSSI and the common framework have proved to be largely problematic in terms of how much they can actually free up for partner countries when the needs are very, very clear. Um, I think that for LDCs alone, debt servicing for 2021 was estimated to be around 50 billion, whereas food import prices were around 47 billion, which means just by debt cancellation, we can have a huge dent in dealing with the food prices that currently exist. So, I mean, there are solutions there. There just needs to be better political will. And the EU can play a role here if it wants to get that leadership role, but it cannot lead by itself. It needs to have the support of the member states and the political will at national level in order to promote these different policies. Sorry, I tried to be very good. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ewan, and sorry that you're at the, at the end. Uh, we did not exchange before this meeting on what you were going to say, so we did not uh, 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 <laughs> turn out well. Agreed, but uh, I mean, I'm, I'm fully in line uh, with what you're suggesting. I mean, I'll, if you allow, there were some questions then and some people who wanted to, to, to raise questions. So if you have an additional 10 minutes, perhaps we could uh, take uh, at least a couple. I've uh, noted that uh, Peter Fish from uh, EAS was already at the beginning of the meeting uh, raising his hand to 
to make a, a, an intervention or a comment. So if a question, uh, Peter, I don't know if you're still in line and if you can make a short, short question or comments. Yeah. Um, thank you, Sam, uh, Sam, and thank you for this very interesting meeting and also to the participants uh, from the panel. Um, I think when it comes to, to uh, strategic objectives and, 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 and um, programming, um, EIS plays, of course, an active role, and we have been doing um, um, trainings together with you, with ECTPM, with Andrew, John, and Alexei, on those matters, inviting INTPA and, um, and, and other Relic CGs. What I want to say is uh, my personal opinion, I'm senior political economist. We are very much geared towards crisis, crisis response, and we are talking a lot about concepts. Now being a Team Europe, a Green Deal, Global Gateway, but we have to bear in mind that those are only concepts. Um, in French, I would say, on parle plus de contenant que de contenu. Uh, what is very important in my 30 years of uh, working for Commission EIS, we have changed our policies when I look to the Mediterranean at least eight times. That makes a new policy initiative every four years. And the last one is now the Global Gateway. Uh, what I want to say very briefly is that we have to be sure that our partners understand what we want. It is totally legitimate for, for us spending taxpayers' money to have an agenda and to be transparent, but to make it a joint agenda with our partners, it has to be discussed. And there's a problem on this side. And um, I mean, that is that is just what I wanted to say. Uh, of course, investment climate, for example, is important, um, but uh, we have to bear in mind that uh, the national authorities have to guarantee a certain framework for it to be positive. We have to bear in mind uh, illicit financing flows that go to other countries when Obama met uh, African leaders, he was the poorest one. So we have to make economic policy decisions. And um, that's what I wanted to say. Let us um, bear those concepts in mind. Let us try to share them with our partners to make them operational, not to change too much in the wording, and, and to work together with all partners, including NGOs and, and, and local partners. That's um, just my reaction. And thank you very much for this very interesting discussion. Yeah, thank you very Back much, you. Peter. Indeed, the way it is received and perceived by partners is, is, is really key. And what I hear, and I'm sure my dear, some of the similar things is sometimes the partner countries get a bit lost with all these acronyms and all these uh, frameworks that we have at the European level. Uh, so that might sometimes make it a, a bit more more difficult to, to understand. And perhaps that's just a personal comment. I've realized that sometimes at the European level, we tend to speak to each other the same way I would speak to the partners. And, and that's perhaps there's a need uh, that's um, turning to, to, to Cable to think about how to you know differentiate uh, a, a discussion that is for insiders of the EU system and, and and understand all the mechanisms and so on and to have a clearer and perhaps simpler way of communicating to, to to the partners so at the end of the day they don't need to understand all our internal all your internal mechanisms but they need to know what you will be able to deliver that just a on suggestion, I don't know if you want to react on that. Or no, no, I agree, but I assume, I mean, you know us so well that it kind of <laughs> felt like. Yeah, I know, but sometimes I get lost and I, I and I hear people, I, I think I, I heard quite somebody echoing saying, we don't understand on, on the, you know, so somebody in, uh, I think it was somewhere in Central Africa saying, we don't understand why when we're talking about infrastructure in, in our country, we suddenly have to hear about the EU Green Deal. What is the connection between the EU Green Deal 
and, and our infrastructure in the country, which of course we fully understand the connection from the EU side, but from the recipient side, I can fully understand how they, they can be baffled by by some of these elements. You want to? If I can yeah. say just, um, my name is Wolfgang Schläger, I'm the head of the EBRD office here in Brussels, just on the communication, also internally, I can tell you from our experience that we have also to communicate in our institutions about the strategic uh, objectives of the of the uh, global gateway you know how we have our strength is uh, to have many offices on the ground in the countries of operation mm -hmm. but then we sometimes have to inform them actually what what global gateway green deal and all these implications are in the perspective so that's it. and it's very good that indeed we do that so EBRD can help perhaps in this <laughs> so uh, translation we are more used to this translation exactly. mechanism <laughs> but i think it, what also has been mentioned a lot today was this uh, you know this coordination i mean it's super challenging because it's such you a want to come here so perhaps people online oh. can see you or it's okay it's okay, okay. okay. And coordination is key um it's so huge and i think what has been said between the banks, between EIB, BRD, between HD and us, we, we have really worked together on many topics, but it's important really that, that the Commissioner and Member States take also the lead, make it workable on the one hand, but also efficient. And I think that's something, and what, what Kai said, that um, the consistency and predictability on processes and frameworks is really important. And I, and once it's in place, then hopefully indeed they will work for longer, longer time. But until it's happening, it's sometimes a challenge. Thank you. There was a question just I see online from uh, uh, also Doris Ashing who was asking as the EU looks inward, will this affect the amount of investment planned by EU DFIs uh, for deployment through private equity funds focused on Africa? I think we can probably safely say, unfortunately, also Bruno Werner to, to leave us at uh, five sharp, but I think we can probably say, no, it will not affect it because DFIs and, and public development banks are focused on investment outside the, the EU or have budgets that are uh, different budget lines for what is inside and, uh, and outside in the case of the EBRD, for instance. So it does not affect what, uh, what is done outside. I don't see any other question. I don't want to keep you longer. So perhaps this is, you know, we were just uh, outlining some of the issues. Uh, we're very keen to try to see how concretely also, I mean, uh, not just from the EU, that is uh, from the European Commission that has a fixed framework, but we a lot was referred to, you know, how we can work better together. It's, it's a process going forward. Uh, and so I think again, you know, because the crisis is so big, it would be nice, especially now I'm turning to, to the member states, perhaps if collectively and the financial institutions, if collectively there could be some, you know, common position that comes on some of the issues that we have addressed instead of, because I've been in other meetings where some of these issues were, were mentioned, but if we could have collective commitments or, or collective options and the Team Europe approach is uh, obviously the, the perfect framework to, to do so. But that would be uh, uh, very helpful, perhaps, in the way forward, and also to increase the visibility of the EU action rather than a number of parallel initiatives where we are all lost to try to get to the overall picture. So thank you very much for your participation. Thank you for those uh, uh, online. Thank you for those that uh, came here for this uh, first uh, hybrid meeting by ECDPM. We'll try to organize uh, much more. Thank you for uh, to the to the French Ministry of uh, uh, for Europe and uh, European uh, for Foreign Affairs for, for their support. Thank you all and uh, wish you a good end of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.